Hello everyone and welcome back to the Benchwarmers podcast. As usual, I'm joined by my co-host Josh Sykes. It's good to be here, Gab. Uh, and we are this week we are joined by a new guest. We've got Kevin Locker, the brand new Harrogate Town signing. Uh, first of all, I think it's fair to say, Kevin, congratulations on your move to the Football League. Lovely, thank you. Yeah, it's been a, a long time coming for me, but I'm just glad to be back in the league and uh, especially with a club like Harrogate as well. Mm, yeah. Uh, I think before we should talk about your move to Harrogate, we should probably start where it all began back in um, Norwich back in 2014, was it? Some, as long ago as that. Yeah, even before um, that, yeah. Yeah, but uh, obviously, how is it actually coming through the youth academy of a big club like Norwich? Was there ever like a weight of expectation on you to probably become a professional footballer? Um, I've had this chat a few times, and to be, honest, to, to be honest, it's more a case of uh, that there's more expectation from other people, like you said, rather than of myself. For me personally, it was sort of a case of going down there, enjoying the experience, and just sort of doing everything I can to, to get a pro contract. Uh, obviously, unfortunately, didn't happen for me. But um, yeah, the expectation mainly was more from the family and friends and school teachers, etc. Mm. So, um, but for me, I, I went there having played no previous professional football or been at any big club. So, uh, in some respects, I was just like a, a kid in the candy, like a, a sweet shop. Like it was just sort of soak it all up and do as best as I can. Yeah, yeah, so how did the scholarship actually come about then at Norwich? Like, just talk us through the process of what happened. Yeah, so uh, to, to get into Norwich, basically, I was playing locally uh, back in Essex for a team called Tilbury. Uh, very randomly, there was a, a Norwich scout there. None of us knew until half time, and uh, we got told. And second half had a great, a great forty-five minutes, and then got picked up, and um, that was for under fifteens, and then. Uh, done pretty well in my under the 15s and under 16s, uh, played up a few times and uh, they offered me a scholarship and then, yeah, I moved down there full-time. Uh, so when we, we talked to uh, Josh Staunton last time, who played for Halifax at the time, he told us to actually get into professional football, you have to get your coaching badges. So have you, um, do you have to do coaching badges to get into it? Um, so you, not to get into it, but whilst you're a scholar, you've got to do your level one and two. Um, I don't think you'll get released if you don't complete it, but yeah. they do encourage you to do it. And um, yeah, it, it was pretty straightforward, really. You just sort of take the under-14s or under-15s at the time and just put a session together. Um, yeah. And to be fair, that's important because, you know, we got that for free and it was all funded for. Obviously, a lot of people got to pay for their coaches, their, their courses and stuff, so... It would be, it's, it's beneficial, especially for later on in, in life and that, you know. Yeah. yeah. So who are you actually in the Norwich Academy that we might know then? So, like, or who was, or another way to put it is, who was a player you were playing with in Norwich Academy who you thought at the time could have gone far or has gone far? Um, so a couple, to be honest. Uh, so throughout my under-15s and under-16s, Angus Gunn, he's the Southampton people right now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's played quite a few games in the Prem. Uh, was he the guy that conceded nine to Leicester? Uh, I think so. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so he, he's one. Then obviously the Murphy twins, Josh Murphy, Jacob Murphy. One's mm. at Cardiff. Uh, I was at Newcastle. I'm not sure if he's still there. I think he's still there. Um, yeah. Uh, and then actually, when I was an under team, we actually had Harry Kane come alone. So I played a couple oh. of games in the in the twenty threes with with Harry Kane, but. Um, and then to be fair a lot of the boys there they've, they've all gone on and done really well uh, a lot of them are playing in the football league Harry Toffolo is playing doing really well for Huddersfield in the championship yes he is yeah <laughs> Josh, Josh is a Huddersfield fan for some reason oh, <laughs> see, yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah no, he, yeah, and he's another one he's had to sort of drop down the leagues he went down to league two and you know done his stuff there and he, he got the move that he deserved and you know I think we're all trying to sort of follow that sort of um, you know follow in his footsteps and do the same yeah. sort of thing yeah uh, so I was genuinely wondering this when reading because me and Josh have never been in the academy and we were just wondering because we know of people who have but they've had to get their positions changed. So when going into the academy, were you originally at a different position and they changed it so you could get more game time or have you always been a centre-back? Uh, no, I was a left-back um, but then I had a crazy growth spurt. Like I grew so many inches in literally like half a year and then at that point they thought, yeah, you know what, well, you're probably best as a centre-half. Probably yeah. get further. Probably get further in the game as a centre half, especially being left footed. There's not too many left footed centre half, so mm. uh, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for that change because I've not done too too bad. So um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what was it like playing with Harry Kane then when he was at Norwich? 
You know what? It was only a couple of games, but what I do remember um, was we we weren't overly. We didn't really rate him in, in terms of him going on to do what he's doing now. I mean, yeah. he's a decent player always, but what he's always had and what we did notice back then was his finishing was always been a joke. Like he he'd stay out after after training with the assistant manager and. Um, He'd have about 20 balls and literally, even with the keeper in there, there's not one that he'd miss. Like, he's either hitting the target or hitting the bottom corner, top corner. He's always been like that, even from a young age. So, um, in that respect, I'm not surprised. But in terms of now, he's quite strong and he's relatively quick and clever. Um, that that has surprised me, to be fair. <laughs> he's mm. done really well. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I think looking back as well, uh, obviously winning the youth, FA Youth Cup against Chelsea, in 2013, I think it was. Um, yeah. Could you, could you? Well, obviously Chelsea, known for having one of the better youth sides in England. How much of a challenge was it to actually come against a team like that? Yeah, so I didn't actually. So I was the first year squad at the time. Unfortunately, I didn't really get the playing time I thought I would. Um, you know, obviously they went on and won, won the youth cup, which was brilliant. Um, yeah. But the occasion, the occasion itself uh, was unbelievable. Uh, that Chelsea team in the final had. A load of star-studded players. You know, Loftus Cheek, I think, was playing. Jeremy Bogart, who's been linked with coming back to the Prem. Yeah. Um, a lo- loads of top talent, and um, it was a two-legged final. And the the, the first leg at Carrow Road, that, that I think that was a sellout. I think you know, twenty-six or thirty thousand. Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, they all come to support in Norwich. Like they're all such a, they're such a you know strong fan base, and there's not too much yeah. out in Norwich to do apart from watch football. So uh, even even with the youth team, they yeah they get behind them, and it was a massive experience and a great occasion. Uh, yeah. Is the second leg sec, sorry? Is the second leg at Stamford Bridge then? Is that how it works? Yeah, yeah. Second leg was at Stamford Bridge, uh, which was again amazing, um, and we went on to win there as well. Um, yeah. You know, it was it was yeah it was crazy. Yeah, we yeah. just. Um, where we, we caused so many problems, like with the Murphy twins and Carlton Morris up front, uh, caused mm. a lot of problems. And yeah, it's too fair, we, we deserve to, to win that, yeah. Yeah, so you were released by Norwich in May 2014. Yeah. And ended up signing for Colchester, but didn't make a single appearance due to a hip injury, was it, that you've kept you out for five months? Yeah, so uh, it was frustrating, really, because obviously coming out of Norwich, uh, dropping into League One, I was expecting to sort of go there and, you know, make a few appearances and, you know, start my career properly from there. But um, I was on the bench, uh, probably would have made my debut relatively soon. And in training, my hip, yeah, my hip just went, um, but I kept playing on it, just sort of being a young a young player. You don't want to sort of, yeah. you know, complain too much. You sort of get on with it. And uh, I'd done that and I made it a whole lot worse and I needed surgery and that kept me out for you know, basically the rest of the season. Um, and obviously, where I hadn't made an appearance, they couldn't offer me a new deal. So, um, that led to me being released from there, and obviously dropping into non-league, yeah. Yeah. How did you actually get over that mental barrier of an injury and moving back into football? Because I, as a young player, it couldn't have helped you, your confidence, really. Uh, yeah, confidence and just mental health was, you know, I went through quite a, a tough period, to be honest. Uh, you know, I went from, you know, being in, youth cup winning team to not having a club and struggling to get a club even in non-league within the space of two years so that that shock mm. and obviously the rehab as well was was massive and you know, I had some dark periods but you know I come out of it in the end and you know um, everything for a reason obviously made me stronger in the end yeah, yeah. what type of an injury was it then because obviously I've just said hip injury but was it like a tendon muscle bone it was a hip, it was a hip label tear so basically what happened was the the bone was ripping through the joint. Um, so what they had to do was like shave off that bone that was ripping through the joint and sort of rebuild the joint using like stem cells and stuff. So it was a really complicated injury. And um, yeah, it took a long time to sort of get back to my normal running mechanics and running properly. Like my first time running, I fell over. Like it was mad. Like it took a long time to get used to my own body again. Uh, but obviously with a lot of hard work and the right people around me I, I, I got through it in the end yeah. uh, Obviously dropping into yeah. non-league then for Welling sorry John <coughs> for Welling, Welling United would you recommend actually moving into non-league for say you've put you've players who've maybe not had the best of luck with injury and are struggling to find a club would you recommend moving from 
say, a League One club like Colchester to non-league to get that experience? Yeah, I mean, I, what I would say is that if you've got an opportunity to play league football and you feel like, you, you know, there's an opportunity there for you, then obviously go for it. But yeah. um, if you've been released and you're struggling to find a club and the club are bringing you in to be not even on the bench, just to be a backup sort of player, then don't do it. Just bite the bullet and drop into non-league because mm. I learned so much through that first year at Wellham. You know, you learn how to become a man. <clears throat> you play with some good players that you don't realise are good players in non-league, players that have played in the Premier League and Championship. And you learn a lot. <clears throat> so, yeah, my, my advice for any young player would definitely be just go wherever you can get games, whether that's League Two, League One, National League, Rhyme Leagues. Like, there's, you know, it's not the end of the world. You can really start your career from there. And you've seen the likes of Jamie Vardy and Ethan Pinnock, these sort of players that have yeah. gone on from you know, non-league, you know, the Dulwich Hamlets, these sort of clubs are now, you know, contesting to get in the Premier League. So it's, it's there and it's, it's possible. So that, that's definitely my advice for every young player. Mm. Yeah. So obviously you signed for Welling after a two-game pre-season trial. Yeah. Uh, made your debut in a 1-0 win against Geisley. So how was, how was your first game for Welling then? Um, I wasn't meant to start. I, I was actually on the bench, um, but the centre half on the day wasn't feeling great, so I just got thrown in. And I remember, like the start of the game, just before the whistle went, I told myself, like, Kev, look, if you can't, if you can't compete here, if you can't handle this level, um, you know, you then, you know, th what else are you going to do? I sort of told, I just told myself, look, if you want to get back to where you were before with the Norwiches and the, the, those sort of clubs you need to sort of master this level. You need to compete in this level. And from that moment, I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to just attack it and go for it. And played really well, assisted the winner. Um, and I was sort of ever present, more nearly ever present ever since. So um, that was a good feeling. And even though the season didn't go as planned, but uh, I said before, I've learned so much in that season, uh, purely from the losses that we took and individual errors and stuff. You learn so much. Uh, I've always actually wondered this then. So... Uh, this is a bit weird, but do you have an agent? Is that how you get trials? Because I always wonder how you players actually get trials at clubs. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you can, you can go through agents. Or for me personally, um, it was sort of a mutual thing. Uh, when I was at coach, the Magnus Akunga, the club captain at the time, he, yeah. um, he spoke to Wellin and on my behalf sort of thing and just said, look, um, you know, the manager was called Louis Fazakali at the time. He, was like, he just said, look, you've got a player at Colchester. He's, you can't get a club. Can you take him for, you know, just for a couple of games and see what you think of him? And that's how I got, that's how I got my um, opportunity. But, yeah, there's agents okay. as well. Yeah, like now I've got an agent and stuff and he got me to Harrogate. But, um, yeah, you, you, you can, there's loads of different ways you can get to trials. Right. Yeah. So yeah. your first goal for Welling came against Woking, right. which is the first half header. And it ended a 23-game winless run. Yeah. So, what what was your like? How did it feel to score your first goal then? Yeah, um, I remember it really well actually. Just sort of headed in the bottom corner. Um, it was really good, a really good feeling. It was sort of a, a confidence booster just to get my first goal in senior football. I was only 19 or 20 at the time, and um, you know, it really sort of obviously gets to get that to get that result as well, which has really made me feel like that we can we can do something now. We can sort of climb out of where we were. Um, and we did go on a little run throughout the season, but it wasn't enough to stay up. And um, But yeah, like for me personally, to get that goal and to stay in the team for the majority of the season, um, you know, it was the best thing that could happen to me. Yeah. I'm not surprised it was Hedda, to be honest with you. Um... <laughs> Uh, at the end of at the end of Wellingham, how come? Obviously, I wasn't following Welling in twenty sixteen. I I probably hadn't even heard of them. Um, but how what ever happened with you leaving the club? Was it just a mutual disagreement? Uh, agreement, sorry. Or was there just better offers on the table? Um, a bit of both, really. I think dropping down into the south. Um, I think they just couldn't offer a deal, you know, for my sort of player. So, for example, in my situation, I probably wanted. A certain amount of money and this sort of guarantee and that, but they couldn't offer that. They wanted to get players in who were experienced and who knew who'd been around the game for a long time to get them back yeah. up to the National League. And um, that, that was fair enough, that was fine because I had the likes of Barrow come in, I had Maidstone come in, I had a few clubs come in, and um, 
I did meet Bauer. I met, I met Paul Cox in the hotel and, um, you know, I, I was very close to signing there, but um, I just, just last minute, I sort of the thought of going up north, I felt a bit young at the time. I, I felt like I had to sort of stay at home for a little longer. Um, yeah. I, I, pulled, I pulled up there and I signed for Maystone in the end. So it all ended up well because I had a great time with Maystone as well. Mm. Yeah. So, so on signing for Maystone, uh, you you said that you were impressed with the three promotions in four years under Jay Saunders. Yeah. So was that a key, another key factor apart from still remaining down south? Was that kind of a major factor for you in signing for them? Yeah, I think any team that has three promotions in, you know, in four years, they're doing something right. And, you know, the club <clears throat> looked promising from who I spoke to and from the people that uh, recommended me to the club. Um, you know, I, I, that was a bit of a no-brainer. And location-wise as well, it was near home for me. Um, when I met the chairman and, the, and Jay Saunders, I knew straight away it was the right club because they gave young people opportunities and it was a good catchment area as well to get to get scouted from. So, um, yeah, yeah. It, it, it was a pretty good decision, I think. Yeah, uh, I could be could be wrong about this, but am I right in thinking Maidstone playing a three G pitch? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Free. Did the did the one you play for them? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, how was it actually like transitioning from grass to three G as your home games? As um, a defender. Yeah, I was I was a bit sceptical through my hip. I I hadn't been on the three G too much from a hip mm. injury at, at Colchester, so I thought a whole season on that. I thought it'd take its toll, but to be honest, I was, you know, I was fine. I played a lot of the games, nearly every game, and um, yeah, I had no issues there. Um, it's it took a little bit of getting used to because you know the flight of the ball and the way it bounces, it, it takes a different sort of um, you know angle when it bounces off the ground and stuff. It's yeah. hard to sort of judge it and that, but uh, you get used to it pretty quick. And they did water it when it got too dry and stuff, so it, it wasn't too bad. And it's it, it's it's a good ground as well. Yeah. So I've got written down here that uh, you scored two goals in a 4-2 win against Chester yeah. for Maidstone, one of them being from a high free kick where you brought the ball down, swivelled and then finished it in the side of the net. <laughs> yeah. That's quoted from Wikipedia, so just tell us about that. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't have too much time to think about it. So it was a, yeah, a deep free kick at Maidstone, sort of when we had a, a set piece, I'd always go you know, up and try and score. And um, it was a, a driven ball with, and up to the back post. And I didn't think I would get there. I thought the guy would header it, the defender in front of me would header it. So I was sort of just standing there and it's landed on my chest. And um, it was just very instinctive. I just sort of done a little bicycle kick. It was just like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just it went in the, uh, in the side netting. So, yeah, it was a, a strike. Pretty finish. decent finish for a centre-half there. Yeah, that, I'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is a bit of a random question, but uh, I've uh, I know someone who goes to a lot of non-league games uh, across the country. He said Maidstone do the best ever pies that he's ever been. Have you ever had one of the pies in the Maidstone pie hut? Um, I actually haven't, but I've, I've not. That's not the first time I've heard that. You know, they do <laughs> I know. Really they do really it's a bit strange. Food, yeah. First time I've heard it. <laughs> yeah, apparently, they do really nice pies. Might need to have a visit to Maidstone. <laughs> 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 so obviously after playing for Maidstone you made 46 appearances scoring four goals you then signed for Stevenage uh, yeah. then a few days after joining you were loaned to Dagenham and Redbridge yeah so did you know the moment you signed for Stevenage that you would be loaned straight out or was it kind of like a, you didn't know um, at the time and you just got told it's a, it's a difficult one so um I went to Stevenage in hope of being a football league player and playing for Stevenage. On the yep. day of sign, on the day of signing, um, my agent at the time um, called me and said, "Look, Kev, you're going to sign, but you're going to go on loan to Dagenham and Redbridge." And me, being 21 at the time, uh, didn't really understand what was going on. I just thought, "Yeah, football league club, all right, cool. Go back into the national league for a bit, but no problem. I'll I'll, I'll go for it." Um, I've done that and, you know, it, it wasn't the best of decisions, really. I should have, you know, I, I maybe should have explored other options or other teams who are willing to play me in League Two rather than go to a club who are going to loan me out. But I made that decision in the end. Um, didn't go to very well with the Maystone fans. Um, they, you know, they, they thought that maybe I just didn't enjoy it there. I just wanted to leave the club and sign for Dagenham, which wasn't the case. But, um, 
you know, I, I think I was a bit misled. And, um, you know, going back, would I have done that? Probably not. But, you know, like I said, everything for a reason and it has made me stronger. Yeah. Uh, following your move to Dagenham and Redbridge then, uh, on your first game, I believe it was against Barrow, you got uh, man of the match. Did that um, come like, did that feel really good of you, so having moved there after, not, uh, I don't want to word it, but being sent straight out on loan by Stevenage? Yeah, it, it was always, it's, it's wherever club you play for, I think the first game is always important. You've always got to sort of, you know, stamp your mark and, and you know, show the fans and show your teammates what you're about. And yeah, uh, luckily I've done that. Um, yeah, played really well. I won the game and uh, yeah, that set us up for a decent little run um, at Dagenham. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So then obviously in February 2018, Stevenage recalled you after 28 appearances for Dagenham and Redbridge. Make, yeah. Then you made your debut in the 85th minute as a sub against Forest Green Rovers. Yeah. So, how was it then to obviously make your debut for Stevenage in League Two? Um, if I'm being honest, it was it's was nice. Like I've always wanted to make my football league debut, but it was quite a bit of a sweet moment because um, I, you know, shortly at that time, I I, I had realised that sort of the club. Stevenage as a club, they weren't keen on me. Like I, I, I could tell, and they just they threw me on as a left back. I'm not a left back, but they threw me on as a left back mm. for four, for five minutes. Um, and I had that in my mind quite a lot of the time. And um, yeah, so it was nice to sort of get my my professional debut and to get my you know football league shirt and stuff. But it it, it wasn't the feeling that I wanted to make yeah. my debut in the football league. Yeah. Let's just say yeah. obviously. Because obviously a week after that, you got loaned out again, but this time to Dover. Yeah. So did you know before making your debut for Stevenage that you'd be loaned straight back out again, pretty much? Yeah, I, I wanted to leave anyway. I wanted to I wanted to leave the club. I wanted to finish the season elsewhere, finish on a high. And, um, you know, Chris Kinnear at the time, he called me and he asked if I wanted to go down there. I said yes straight away. And um, just to try and get him into the playoffs. Uh, so I went down there, played really well, just missed out on playoffs, I think, on goal difference in the last game. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I just wanted to get out of the, cl- out of the club, really, brutally honest, um, mm. and just start start fresh somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, how was it working under Chris Kinnear? Because obviously he's a bit of a Dover Athletic legend. Um, how was it actually working under him? Yeah, it was good. He's um, he, His approach to football is very different. We played in a way that was um, man-marking. So I'd have an, a player that I had to mark throughout the whole game. And basically, wherever he went, I went. Um, <laughs> even if he dragged me out into silly areas, I'd just follow my man. So it was a very different way of football. And, but it was quite effective because it, it sort of baffled a lot of teams and they couldn't really suss yeah. what was going on. But it was good. It was only part-time, but um, I really enjoyed it there. It was very, very laid back and everyone enjoyed their football. And that's what you want. So you want to enjoy your football and you want to have... Uh, a good change room and a good atmosphere, and we definitely had that there. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So, so then in 2018, you signed for Dover permanently for an undisclosed fee, which turned out to be your most prolific season in front of goal with six goals, which then led to yeah. you being named Players Player of the Year. Yeah. So obviously, as a player being recognised by your teammates as being the best player in the team that season, how did that feel? Yeah, it was brilliant. Um, I was sort of a man on the mission that year. I you know, just coming out of Stevenage and not having the best of times yet. I just, I just needed a good season. I wanted to prove a lot of people wrong and just to have a good season. Obviously, Dover, we just about stayed up. You know, we we had, didn't have the great seasons, but um, me personally, I could be quite happy with how I'd done. You know, I was ever-present. Um, you know, played a lot of games and scored a lot of goals. I got my Vanarama National League Player of the Month award in January, I think, and that was another... Nice achievement for myself, and then obviously to top it off with, top it off with, you know, surviving relegation and um, players player. Um, you know, meant a lot. You know, the teammates <clears throat> to have, to have them vote for you for player of the season is is always it's the best award I think for any player. So I was really grateful for that, and um, you know that that sort of got my confidence back in terms of you know pushing on again. Yeah. Uh, so, like Josh has said, if you're getting six goals in the season, uh, how did that even come about? Is it the man marking making you move up front, or was it just from cards? Um, so basically, I hadn't scored. I, I only scored one goal with Chris Kinnear in charge, but um, because of our poor start, he got sacked, and uh, Andy yeah. Hesentard had come in 
Um, I think it might have been November time. I, I could be wrong, I'm not too sure. But once he come in, um, he recognised my threat from set pieces and we worked a lot on set pieces. And um, as long as the delivery is right, nine times out of ten, I'm probably going to hit the target and I'm, I'm, I'll probably beat my man in the air. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I did that and I uh, scored quite a few goals. And um, yeah, and I was really pleased just to... You know, just just to contribute more up the other end, I always try and sort of put myself in a position where I can score, and I've done that quite a few times that year. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so obviously, you finished that season nine games unbeaten, ended up finishing in fourteenth. So was that nine game unbeaten run? Did that obviously stem from the fact that you could have been relegated? So you all just mentally just came together and then pushed through to the end of the season. Uh, I think once we survived, uh, you know. I think we sort of enjoyed our football a lot more and we played with a lot of freedom and there's, there was no real pressure. And then we, re, we just realised then that, you know, once you do relax and when you do sort of enjoy your football, you, you'll you still win games. You don't have to be too paranoid and too stressed out and too, you just need to enjoy your football, like whatever yeah. level, level you're playing, like just keep enjoying it and play with freedom and play with a smile on your face, which we did. And we still won games. And I think, you know, um, a lot of people can take a lot from that because there's no point stressing out over things you can't control. Over you can control is doing 100%. And, um, you know, as long as you're enjoying that as well, then then you're going you're gonna to do well. Yeah. Uh, so I was just wondering, as a player, when you were at Dover and obviously Andy Hessenthaler came in, Eastley, uh, Eastley, the team he was at before, were in the playoffs, if I'm right in thinking. So as a yeah. player, why, was it a bit of a surprise that he came in to say Dover were in a worse position than Eastley at the time? Uh, initially it was, but then I think we found out that uh, the gap at Andy has entirely, he had family in and around Dover. So oh, okay. it, it, it made sense for him. They gave him a good contract. I think it was a three-year contract. I'm not too sure, but um, yeah. it, it was an opportunity for him to be close to his family. And um, yeah, it, it's, when you look at it in that way, it was, it's not too surprising. I think he just... Wanted yeah. to see more of his, his grandchildren and stuff. So, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's fair so enough. It. Last season, you were named Dover captain. Yeah. So, how did it feel? Because uh, I've seen your interview when you were at Dover, like uh, just before the start of the season, I think when you were talking about how all the players were saying in your group chat that you should be captain. And then he pulled yeah. you aside and just kind of told you were. So, how did it feel to be named club captain? Yeah. Um... In that interview, I said that I weren't really expecting it, but in my head, I, I think I was because I had a good season, and you know, I'm I'm quite a, a strong personality in in the change room and stuff. So I was pretty, I, I was surprised in the way that you're never too sure, but at the same time, it's a good decision, I think, from the manager. <laughs> um, <laughs> would, you, would you consider yourself a leader then? Yeah, I, you know, I don't. It's. I think it's more a natural thing. I don't try and be a certain way. I think yeah. for me, when I'm when I'm in the team and I try and um, win football matches, I always try and give 100% and encourage others, and you know, try and use my voice um, as as much as I can. And um, naturally, I, I do that pretty well. So uh, in that sense, yeah, I, I guess I, I'm quite a natural leader in that sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And obviously, last season you were named Fans Player of the Year as well. Yeah. So, is it nice to obviously have the recognition from the fans in getting an award from it, as opposed to just them messaging you on social media and putting comments and things? Obviously, like having that physical award. Yeah. No, it was good. Um, <clears throat> you know, the they they they've been brilliant to me and for me, and um, they've always supported the team and me in particularly. Uh, so it was nice that they they reckon you know I had that recognition from them. Um, and yeah, it's, it's it's always nice to get an award and um, to get it from the fans and from the players from the season before. It, it's it's been a good couple of years there. Yeah. Uh, are you going to miss Dover Athletic then? Well, obviously not miss because you're getting a big move up, but uh, yeah. the fan base and well, obviously I'm predicting you're moving away from your family because you've played down south for most of your career. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah, there'll be aspects that I do miss, but. Um, I think I spent a good amount of time there and I've got no regrets from my time there. Um, so for me, it's just a chapter closing, a new chapter now. And, um, mm. and, you know, I haven't looked back since. I'm just excited to get going for Harrogate and to to play well. And hopefully this this team can do exactly what we've done last year, just to keep cracking on, keep pushing on and 
you know, not settle for the bare minimum and I'm excited for that. Yeah. So obviously, speaking of Harrogate, how did the move come about then? Um, so my agent messaged me saying that they were interested. Um, they had a few options, I think. So it took a little, a little longer than I thought it'd be, but um, I stayed patient because I had other op- uh, offers in the National League and a couple of interests in league football as well. But the, the thought of Harrogate just coming up into the Football League, uh, you know, having this played against them the season before, looking at the setup and the, the fan base and even the area as well, you know, it's um, it all sort of ticked. A lot, a lot of boxes and um, so I stayed patient um, I got myself a job whilst I was waiting and you know just, just to, to keep myself busy and get some money in um, you know thankfully that paid off and I didn't rush into signing for another club because then Harrogate you know they, they came in and they liked what they saw from watching my videos and from when we played against them last season and uh, yeah I'm grateful I waited because you know it's, it's, it's a great move for me yeah. So what job did you get then? I was I was driving vans for Amazon. Um, yeah, yeah. I was just, I was doing that for about a good six weeks to nearly two months, and yeah, I, I I had to find a way just to to work and you know pay the bills and stuff. And I, I was doing that, and you know it was very eye opening. I've not really worked properly for well ever really, again, apart from a bit of coaching. So it was um, a different experience, but it's it's another thing to add to you know, as the things I've done, I guess. And, yeah. you know, um, it, it was good at the time. Yeah. Uh, have, you, have you had a chance to meet Simon Weaver then? Or is he yeah. still? Because, yeah. Yeah, Sorry. yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah no, we had, we had training this morning and, you know, I've met the gaffer and met with the boys and it's been brilliant. Um, these team, like, the, the team is very fit, obviously, having come off the playoffs and stuff, they've been training for a while and... Um, yeah. You know, it's it's really good to see how how fit the lads are, and because I think, especially in League Two, the fitter teams usually do pretty well. And um, yeah, it, I'm just excited for the season to start now. Yeah, everyone's been brilliant from on and off the pitch. I guess like the the backroom staff all been very friendly, and the gaffer, the coaches, they, they've all been brilliant to me. And um, you know, I just just can't wait to get the preseason games underway now. Yeah. yeah. I've got a I've got a newspaper article here with an interview from Weaver's number two. Okay. So he's describing you as being a strong, powerful lad uh, with a great range of passing and being good in possession. So would you would you agree? Uh, to be fair, he couldn't have really complimented me anymore, really. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. To be fair, I I'm you know naturally I'm a big lad and powerful and uh, decent pace as well and. Um, you know, my range of passing is something I take good pride in. I like to hit quite a lot of diagonal balls and keep the ball down as well and to just to keep keep possession of the football. And um, at Dover, I didn't really have the opportunity to do so. We played a certain way that was very direct. And of course, you've got to be direct at times, but I like to keep the ball down and play football. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited to do that here with, um, yeah, with, with Harrogate. Is there a team in League Two that you're looking forward to coming up against? Um, a couple. I'd say Bolton. Obviously, coming down, uh, that's going to be a good, a good atmosphere, a good, a good test, at a nice stadium, a big club. Um, and then I get for me personally, Leighton Orient because it's a, a local one for me. It's around the corner. I'm sure yeah. a lot of friends and fam. If if fans are let back in, hopefully, but yeah. uh, I'll have loads of friends and family come down to that. So that would be a good one as well. But um, there's a lot of big clubs in that league, and um, you know a lot of a lot of good sides and we'll have to make sure we're, you know, we're, we're hundred percent to, to, to do well, but I'm sure we will. Mm. Yeah. I know, I know Gab wanted you to say Bradford then. <laughs> I can't, I can't tell you. Bradford Valley's just waiting for you to say That's Bradford. That's another one to be fair. That is another Biggest one. Biggest team you lead like. to, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, talk, it's going to sound a bit strange, obviously, but talking about Bradford, um, obviously Harrogate haven't really had a big Yorkshire derby in quite a few years. So we weren't, I can't think of another Yorkshire team in, the other than Halifax, maybe. Oh, actually, I don't know I'm about them. They've got Halifax and Geisley, haven't they? Uh, but you think playing against Bradford's going to be a bit of a different experience? Yeah, definitely. That's an, another huge club, uh, lovely stadium as well. So, um, 
you know, that's going to be amazing, especially for Harrogate being sort of first year in the football league and yeah. against a massive club like Bradford. So when we do them one nil away, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. <laughs> cool, cool. <laughs> not, not going to comment on that. Not going to comment. No, I'm just waiting for it to come through on Sky Sports. Like Kevin Locker has jumped up for an header and he's banged it in bottom corner against Bradford. I'm just waiting I'll be for in that. Tears. I'll be in absolute tears. <laughs> uh, so, go yeah, on, Gab. No, sorry. No, no, it's you're... just you. Go off, it's fine. it's fine. I was about to go into England, so if you've got some on Harrogate. Oh, all right. Uh, obviously, then, as Josh is a Huddersfield fan, I'm a Bradford fan, we're both aware of John Stead's work at just football. I don't know where I'm going with that. Uh, how have, you, have you had actually a chance to meet John Stead and properly talk to him? Yeah, yeah, trained today. Um, mm. Had a good chat with him. Lovely guy. Uh, very humble, considering what he's achieved and what he's done and the level he's played at. Um, you know, he's a very nice guy and a really good player still as well. Obviously, I played against him last season, but seeing him in training today, really good player, technically very good, good finisher. And um, I'm looking forward to playing with him because I think he can, he's on and off the pitch. He could be very influential as he was last year. Yeah. yeah. So in May 2017, you were called to the England C team. Mm. Uh, how did that call up come about then? Like, was it, was it the classic, you're waiting for it and you get the phone call telling you you're in or is it? Um, you know what? I think it was during the time where I was scoring a few goals. So when I scored two against Chester, um, I scored one against Southport as well um, in and around that time. And um, Paul Faircroft, the manager, I believe he was at the games and he had a good look and he was impressed by what I was doing. And um, he, he got in contact with Maidstone and who, who got in contact with me and uh, yeah, then I was there. It was it was an unbelievable experience, you know. Even though it's England C, it's not actual England, but it's it's still a great achievement. And it was yeah, it was brilliant. Yeah. So making your debut in a two-one win against Punjab FA. Yeah. Uh, where are Punjab actually from then? Because I don't um, to... <laughs> No, basically, I think it's a selection of of the Asian players in England who play at different levels. I think, anyway, I'm not too sure, but I'm pretty sure they, like, can pick the best Asian players who play in England. Um, okay, in the, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, who, and to be fair, they were good players. That They were really, they surprised us because I think at the start initially, we thought, you know, it was just going to be like, you know, a bit of a jolly up, really. But it was, it was a yeah. really tough test, like, you know, um, because we they were playing that sort of, your red itches and the teams lower down the pyramid. And, you know, we assumed that for that reason, that it'd be, you know, not straightforward, but we thought it'd be, you know, a comfortable win, but it wasn't at all. They were really good. And, you know, it was a real good advert for Asian football as well, you know, sort yeah. of coming up, giving a good, you know, a good England team, um, top, top players in National League football, a, a great test and nearly, they nearly won the game. And, you know, it was a good day for everyone. Yeah. Uh, was Absolutely. there any not- notable players? Oh, sorry. Uh, any like notable players that you played alongside in that England C squad? Um, Who maybe gone to bigger and better things? Uh, I'm trying to think now. Mm. In terms of going higher, I don't think so. Uh, James Alabi, he got obviously his moves to Leighton Orient. Uh, oh, yeah. he, played, he played in that game. Um, Callum Howe, he's at Solihull now. It was me and Callum Howe at the back, who he was also at Harrogate before. Um, mm. and Ross uh, Ross um, don't want to get his second name wrong um, Ross Fitzsimmons I think he, he's at Notts County um, yeah. he's doing pretty well uh, the goalkeeper but yeah no, everyone's I think everyone's still playing at a decent level and um, you know it was nice because after the second game we had um, we all got a sort of our shirt signed by everyone in the team and stuff so it was it's sort of a good little send off for you know, going back to our, our original clubs after that. Mm. Yeah. So the England C team then, do they train uh, at the same place the first team does? Um, or is so it like we, I think it depends where you're playing a few days before. So we trained leading up to the matches. And um, so the first game against Panjab was at Soddy Hall's um, stadium. So we, we trained at uh, Wolverhampton in their sort of arena, in their indoor dome. And uh, we'll, we'll stay in there for a few days of training there. Um, but then, yeah, it just depended on who you're playing against. And then they'll sort of pick a training ground close to where the match is. Yeah. Who did, where was the actual game played at? So it was at, it was at uh, Solihull. Um, 
that was oh, their, their, oh, their stadium. Oh, okay. Yeah, their stadium. Yeah, yeah. And then the, we had a game against Jersey as well um, in Jersey. So we flew over to Jersey and, and uh, we lost on penalties, I believe, against Jersey. But that was, yeah, it was, it's still a good experience. Yeah. 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 So, what football team do you actually support then? Like moving moving away from your career, just onto like some general football chat now. Yeah, so, yeah. Like, what what team do you support then? Um, so, I've always been a Man United fan, even though I've you know I'm nowhere near Manchester, but you know I've always been a Man United fan. That's my glory sort of team. But I've got so- I've got a soft spot for West Ham as well. Um, you know I'm local to West Ham and just my local team. So. Um, I will always keep an eye out for their results as well. Did you watch, watch, did you watch Man U Sevilla last night? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> did you watch that, that last night? Did you watch Man U Sevilla last night? I did, yeah, I did. It was so frustrating. <laughs> um, especially the second goal. Oh, I, was tear, I was tearing not all the hair I have left. Like It was just so frustrating. Like, yeah, no, very frustrating. Poor defending. <laughs> Are you uh, Ole, Ole in or Ole out? I'm Oli in, um, only because I think if you stop the work he's done and you bring in a new manager, that's going to take him another year or two to get, uh, you know, sort of used to the, being the Man United manager. I don't think you can't bring in anyone to Manchester United and sort of expect them to hit the ground running. It's too much of a big club. They're going to have to make mistakes and do their things. But I think, you know, he's going in the right direction. I think just defensively for Man United, they need to really improve. Um Obviously, they've got Maguire in now, but I still think in the full-back positions, especially left-back, they need the out-and-out left-back. Obviously, yeah. Luke Shaw is a bit hit and miss with injuries and stuff and another centre-half and, you know, a centre-forward as well, actually. Um, so, <laughs> a few Not like him by Shell up top, though. Um, me, personally, no. I think he's a great player, but as a number nine, he I think he misses too many chances. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, for me personally, anyway, I think he, he's got to sort of be more ruthless in front of goal. You need like a Harry Kane for me, I think. You need, yeah. need someone who's guaranteed to put the ball in the goal if they've got a chance. Yeah. That's what they need, mm. I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, we we'll keep doing this. Do you want to? Yeah, you go, go All right. Um, so, uh, continuing on with just random football then. Uh, in terms of having played quite a lot of non league football yourself, are you agreeing with the hashtag let fans? I think it's hashtag let fans in or let fans back in campaign where, because obviously at non-league, there's, there's not massive fan bases. It's not really going to be too close together and risking the coronavirus and the second spike. So do, are you actually supporting the campaign or do you think it might be a bit too early to let the fans back in? No, I'm definitely supporting it. I think if it's too early, then there wouldn't be people watching the snooker. People sitting indoors watching the, the snooker. Mm. Um, you know, there's a lot of people in there and that's indoors as well, you know? And I think, if you go down to the lower league level, um, it's, it's so easy to sort of, if there's a thousand people or not even a thousand people, or a lot less than that, 500 people at a game, it's, you know, it's a, bi- a big old pitch and you're outside and I'm sure there's ways you can sort of social distance and yeah, uh, the, fact, the fact that you can go to restaurants and bars and, you know, I, I went for dinner last week in, uh, back in East London in Shoreditch and, um, you know, it was absolutely rammed. People were everywhere. There was no one, no one sort of marshalling that. So if you can do that stuff, then football, which people know and love and take good pride in watching their matches, I think that's surely they, they should be able to let fans in. I'm hoping that hashtag and hoping that the, the movement sort of encourages the higher people to, to let fans in. Yeah, yeah. because obviously they're also on about doing that quarter capacity. So I, mm. I think they started doing it in France. I remember... Paris Saint-Germain friendlies before they've come back into the Champions League. They had like 5,000 fans watching, just everyone social distancing. Do you think that's some of that would be good to be implemented into England, possibly? Yeah, I think it's a case of um, there's no harm in trying, I guess. If it doesn't go well or they, you know, fans are sort of not obeying the rules and they're, they're acting silly and stuff, then, you can, then you've got every reason to sort of go back on what you've you know, implement. I, I think just not doing anything right now is probably the worst thing. I think if you take steps, and you know, I think I think now we must be ready to introduce some fans. Um, and yeah, like like they're doing the twenty five percent capacity. Um, you know, I think that's a good idea, especially to start off with. And you know, yeah. and just hope they just hope that the fans are you know 
abiding by the rules and and doing the right things. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit unfortunate time for Harrogate having come into the football league and not going to have the proper backing of their supporters, obviously. Um, the way I think it's, I'm not 100% sure because it's a bit complicated, but the way Bradford are doing it is where they let a certain capacity, it might be 5,000, it might be a bit more than that, I don't know, a certain amount of fans in for one game and then the next home game after that, they let the fans who didn't get in for that game into that game and they keep going back and forth. As, have you, and obviously, this isn't your thing to say, but uh, are you aware of anything that could be happening at Harrogate to let fans back in? Um, not, uh, right now, not really. No, I'm not too sure. Um, obviously, they got, they're getting their this, this stadium. Uh, we're getting our stadium sort of uh, yeah. ripped up at the moment anyway. Uh, so, we're playing at Doncaster. Um, yeah, I'm not aware of anything yet. I've not heard nothing. Um, there's obviously rumours of this, that and everything, but there, there's no real, there's no real, you know, timeline, I think, in terms of yeah. when we'll be able to see the fans. And it's a shame because, especially as a new player, you want to sort of, play the first game and play in front of the fans and, you know, make a good impression and stuff and meet everyone. But unfortunately, life happens and we, we've just got to sort of hope that it gets back on track soon. Yeah, yeah I hopefully. Think, I think the last thing from me is uh, back on to obviously you personally. Where do you see yourself career-wise in like five years' time? Um, so I try not to look ahead too much, but for me... I've got huge ambitions for myself. Um, I I can't get somewhere and just be happy with what I'm doing. And even if I'm doing well, I can't. I'm never satisfied. So, ideally, you know, to do well with Harrogate and to to push Harrogate and to hopefully gain promotions within that within that timeline. Um, and ideally, for me personally, if I could if I could play in the championship, if I could play in League One. Um, I'd be happy, but then if I do get there, I wouldn't be happy then either. I, I think I'm, I've got too much hunger inside me to be at one a certain level for too long. Um, yeah. You know, now I've got now I've got my move into the football league. It's it's a case of to keep pushing on, you know, just to keep pushing on, keep improving, and um, not let anything sort of get in my way in terms of you know progressing and doing well. So hopefully that can be a start for this year with Harrogate and um, what the future you know holds. We'll see, but. Yeah. Yeah. I have one more question, which is a bit of a strange one. Um, how do you pronounce your last name? Because it's spelt a bit um, A D O M. Is, is it just Adam? Um, so my, my middle my middle name is Adam. So it's like Adam. Adam. Yes, it's basically Adam with an O rather than an A. A lot of people think when I so when I fill in forms and stuff, a lot of people think it's Adam, and they think I've just sort of like miss, miss well, my handwriting is not very good or whatever. But yeah, it's yeah. Adam. It's, it's, it's a Ghanaian name. Um, yeah, then obviously Loco, my last name, which people get wrong as well. People say Loco or... Yeah, know, we were discussing this before and how to pronounce <laughs> that. Yeah. Is nah, it Loco? Loco, Loco, yeah. Loco, Loco. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, have you got any more questions, Josh? No, that, that's me done. All right, well, that's going to bring the end of this week's episode of the Bench Warmers podcast. As usual, I'd like to thank my co-host, Josh Sykes. Cheers for having me on, Gavin. Kevin, it's been a pleasure. Uh, yeah, of course, thank you to Kevin Locker for joining us this week. I just make sure that uh, best of luck for the future and with Harrogate Town. Uh, we hope you, well, I, I hope Harrogate stay up personally, but yeah, yeah. I'm sure you will. Uh, yeah, thank you all for watching and we'll see you next week. Cheers. Thank you very much.